Hi, this is Joe Avati and welcome to Church Street Studios. This is my Sydney studio where I record my podcast, A Serious Chat with a Comedian. So today my guest is a gentleman who's an actor. He was on a show called Kingswood Country, which was very, very popular in the early 80s in Australia. And he played Bruno, the son-in-law of Ted Bullpit who was played by Ross Higgins. Now, what's important about this show, it was probably the first time you ever heard the word wog on Australian TV, which is obviously very, very important. So let's meet Bruno, Mr. Lex Marinos, my guest today. Let's get in there. So Lex, thanks very much for joining us today, mate. It's a great pleasure, Joe. And, um, so let's start. You you know, you're Greek heritage, but you're actually mm. born in Australia, right? In Wagga Wagga. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously, you know, you're the Wagga Wagga Wog. That's right. And uh, that's not the first time you've heard that. Did you did, Have you come up with that or someone else no, come up? Well, I, no, I used to say um, from Wagga Wagga to Wagga Rama. All right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, stupidly, it never really occurred to me, except that I remember on, on uh, Kingswood Country, somehow it came up one day. And uh, and I said, I oh, know I was born in Wagga Wagga. Yeah. And the writers just went, <laughs> gold, gold we is. can milk this. Yeah. We'll get 10 episodes yeah. out of this. Why don't you go back to your own country? Listen, for the last time I'm an Australian, I was born here. Where? Wagga. That'd be right. <laughs> but it never occurred to me that, the, you know, maybe I was just dumb, but it never yeah. occurred to me that there would be such a good joke in it. Yeah. And... But it's it's funny how it's followed me all around the world, uh, you know, because it's on my passport. Right. I remember we were in, um, I think we were in Austria or Germany, mm. and uh, and you know I had the checking in at the airport or something, yeah. and, you know, and and uh, the woman who was checking us in, she looked at the pass, she started. Boop, boop. <laughs> I said, "What's so funny?" She said, "Wogga wogga." Yeah. And I said, "Well, where are you from?" She said, "Baden Baden." <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, are we right. going to say everything twice? Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, and so let's go to your history. I mean, you so you were born in Wagga Wagga. Yeah. How did you go from there to to being an actor? You know. Uh, well, so we had you know Greek family. We had a yep. cafe. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone else works. Something. Someone's got to feed them. Yeah. So we'll do that. Yeah. And uh, and w- but one of the big advantages, apart from me, a little bit of pinch lollies and cigarettes yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. The biggest advantage was that in return for putting up posters in the shop window, yeah. we would get tickets to the shows right. that came through town. Yeah. And the show that I used to love every year was uh, a show, Sawley's, George Sawley and Mrs. Sawley. It was a travelling tent show. So it's, right. there was a vacant paddock up near the railway station yeah. and they'd put up a tent and, you know, this... And it was like a, an old Tivoli show. It was, it was really high-class... Vaudeville. Vaudeville, yeah. You know, acrobats, singers, dancers, yeah. ventriloquists, magicians, you know, the chorus girls. And uh, there was this particular show, I must have been about eight or nine, I, I think. Mm. And um, and I remember this one act distinctly, this incredibly glamorous woman came out. Mm. Wow. And, you know, and she started moving and the, the drums were happening and, you know, mm. but nothing intense. She started moving. It seems, and I thought there's something weird going on here because mm. she's losing some of her clothes. <laughs> she <laughs> yes. mustn't have yeah. d- you yeah. know, done the zippers up yeah. or something because they're falling off her. And more and more, and the drums started to get insistent. And I thought, wow, this is something going on here. And I knew there was something going on because mum had started to bite her bottom lip. <laughs> <laughs> and dad had gone, And so the drums got bigger and they crashed to this crescendo and more and more clothes are coming off and she's just, she's just in her sparkly undies mm. and I thought this is well, wow this is bizarre and then the climax the drum big simple crash and she ripped off her wig and it was a man right and I thought what yeah whoa this is the business I want to be in yeah, <laughs> I don't right. know why but I just thought in that moment I thought well, this is something magical yeah going on here it, it attracted you I mean you were eight years old what year was this Oh, I would have been in the 50s, in, yeah. you know, country town in the 50s. What, um, what sort of population did Wagga Wagga have in the 50s? At that stage, it was because it, it was about 25,000 because it was kind yeah. of the centre of the Riverina yeah. regional area. Mm-hmm. You know, we were near, and we were mainly Greeks. So the Italians were mainly in Griffith and yeah. Leeton. Yeah. And, 
And so in that, at that time, there was quite a network of Greek cafes in, still yeah. in the city. So there was quite a substantial little Greek community there. So it was very protected and, and stuff. But, um, I never uh, knew that. I never knew that there was a lot of Greeks in Mongolia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, obviously, I know there's a lot of Italians in Griffith and Lincoln, yeah. but... I yeah, most that. of the cafes, there, and there was kind of a cafe on every corner. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're all since gone. I think there's one or two left. Uh, our, our cafe's left, um, and I still go and visit there, and I I wonder, I ask you if it owns it. I said, do you mind if I go upstairs? And I think, that's weird. Yeah. Where's this weirdo? Yeah. I said, no, I, it used to be my bedroom, yeah. and I just wanted yeah. to check it out. Because yeah. um, we lived above the shop, of course. Uh, and so there was, you know, a substantial little community there, and... and um, and so for the first early years of my life, I, that's all I knew. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. very protected and, and my mum was super protective mm-hmm. and, and dad was a bit of a larrikin. He got out a bit. But, um, but you know, it was a very enclosed, comfortable, well protected little community. You know, yeah. it wasn't until I went to school that I sort of really started to engage with the wider community and yeah. everything changed. Yeah, of course. You know. And what it, so how did you go from there, you know, being a kid growing up in Wagga Wagga to ending up on... On Australian TV. Uh, well, we knew we several things that happened at, in the early sixties. All came together. My grandfather, my mother's father, who'd come out as a teenage boy mm. from one of the islands, uh, he died, um, and it was essentially his cafe. So he died, and he had four daughters, of which my mum was the eldest. Two had already married and fled to Sydney, uh, and my folks were splitting up then because. <laughs> Because Dad was a gambler. Right. Oh, could he gamble? And he right. always read the long odds. You know, he right. always, he always was, he was always, uh, you know, death or glory. Yeah, right. And I think, I think the the clincher was when he lost the deeds to oh, the cafe. No. Oh no! And you know, the bank manager rang Mum on Monday morning saying, "Look, you know, I think there's trouble going on." So they split up uh, sadly, which is unusual, really, for oh, uh, unusual, you know, a, a couple, uh, you know, ethnic couple yeah, back in no. Yeah, those times to very, split up, right? But I can, I mean, Dad was so ill-equipped to, to mm. be a parent. And anyway, time came for me to go to university, uh, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I knew I, I couldn't be a doctor. I, mm. I, I mean, I, it's a noble profession, but it just wasn't me. And, yeah. And one doctor in the family's enough. enough you yeah. Know. Um, but I did, I was interested in journalism and writing mm. and stuff like that. And so I went to the University of New South Wales here in Sydney and that just that just inaugurated a school of drama. Right. And I'd always loved, you know, I'd always loved the pictures and the radio yeah. and the TV yeah. and stuff like that when we finally got it. Uh, but the real clincher for me, I, I could see there were a lot of girls yeah. doing that course. It always comes down to girls, doesn't it? It always comes yes. down. <laughs> always. Yeah. And I, I thought... You know, I could see the number, and the number of boys that were enrolling was very few. <laughs> the girls were a yeah. lot, and I thought, I'm, you know, the odds are good here. Yeah. And then I discovered that a lot of the boys weren't interested in the girls anyway. Yeah, they right. were interested yeah. in some of the other boys. Yeah. And I thought, these odds are getting better, better. and better. <laughs> but I'm in here. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's really how what drew me to the School of Drama. And then, you know, I started to get into student productions. And, and I was lucky that there was a, a really attractive Lebanese girl living upstairs in the units we were in. And, um, and she worked for a promoter, uh, a concert promoter. And so she would get tickets to all of the stadium shows, the right. old stadium rock yeah. and roll shows, yeah. you know, in the early... Beatles show and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And so I, I got to see a lot of stuff through that and started working as an extra right. in movies just to supplement my scholarship Yeah, because um, it was pretty meagre and I needed a bit more cash. And so I started doing that. And then by the time I'd finished university, because I went when I was very young and, and I, I needed to get out, I needed to do something else. And I, I thought uh, I'll give acting a go for a year and if if there's nothing there, then I'll come back to university. I'll become a doctor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, yeah. for prospective patients, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, I thought, you know, yeah. I spoke to my parents about it, and I, I said, look, as long as there's a job on the horizon, yep. I'd like to give it a go. I keep yep. going. And, and I'm happy to say that 50-something years later, there's still a job cool. on the horizon. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And let's get, let's, let's get to, to how you got onto uh, Kingswood Country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tell us about that. Uh, because you know, you know, for for those who are listening who don't know about the show, it was, it was 
It was a very interesting kind of show. I mean, I remember watching it. I was a big fan of it. But it was the first time that I remember seeing ethnic characters or an ethnic character on TV. And the first time I remember the word wog. Yeah. Now, for those people listening in from England, um, the word wog means something, you know, quite derogatory in England. But in Australia, for just, just to clarify, for, for those people who are watching or listening in from um, America or from England or other parts of the world, WOG in Australia is a, is a collective term for Greeks, Italians, anyone kind of from anyone Europe. Who's and, non-English. Who's non-English, yeah, really, yeah. you know. And, and, and we're okay with it. It's not so much derogatory these days. But back in the 80s, Oh, right. yeah, and before that, you know, as a kid, I remember the word Dago yes. was used a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember my 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 papu was a Dago and mm. my dad was a Dago, and I thought, well, I guess I'm a Dago mm. too. But then it became it became Wog. And uh, and the show came about because um, the two writers and producers of it, Gary Riley and Tony Sattler, they'd already been doing a sketch show for Channel 7 mm-hmm. here in Australia in Sydney, uh, called The Naked Vicar Show. Right. And one of the sketches they had, which was loosely based on Gary's father, was this character called Ted Bullpit, who was a classic old-style Aussie male who, yeah. you know, who hated everything. Yeah. You know, he hated wogs, he hated women, he hated Catholics, he yeah. hated yeah. poofters, he hated yeah. everything, yeah. Yeah. you know, that challenged him. Um, and... And they decided to spin that off into a series, to do a pilot for a series to see whether it would work in a half-hour format. Yeah. And and they kind of had the template from England. They had a, a series called Till Death Us Do Part with yes. Warren Mitchell as Alf Garnett. And there was an American version called All in the Family, yeah. Archie Bunker. was the character. And in each case, they had a... A problematic son-in-law for the for the arch or the central character, and so uh, they were looking around. They thought it'd be a good idea if Ted Bullpit had a wog son-in-law. Yeah, and so uh, so I auditioned for it, and we went in. We're chatting like we're chatting now, and they said, that, "You know, that's great. Would you like to you know do read and stuff?" Yeah. And so we started to read and do the audition, and I could see them getting look like looking at one another, saying, mm. oh, there's something. I said, what, "Is there something wrong?" Yeah. And they said, "Well, we thought you'd do an accent." Mm. And I said, "But why? I mean, I'm born here. We've just been chatting for half an hour. I haven't needed an accent, and most of the kids I know, most of my friends, are also Wog families who yeah. are born here. You yeah. know, our parents yeah. migrated, but we've tried to." assimilate and yeah. become part of the wider culture. Anyway, and I said, and and prior to that, I'd been doing bits of TV and a lot of them were, you know, otherness yeah. characters. And I was a bit sick of doing accents, yeah. you know. And, and also the the notion that was that the other was just anything that wasn't English. Yeah. You know, I mean, I did say to him at one point, I said, but I'm Greek and the character's Italian. Italian. It's mm-hmm. like. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah. what's the difference? Yeah. Said, well, we have different <laughs> languages, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. Oh, no, you know, a wog's a wog. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Anyway, so well, that, that's interesting. That point that, that they actually thought that. Oh, you know, I, I mean, obviously, you knew that there is a distinction between, you know, the different. I just played. Yeah. I, I just played the other yeah. characters, whether mm-hmm. they were Italian, Spanish, Sri Lankan, yeah. Pakistani. It didn't yeah. matter as long as it was. The other, yeah, that's what I got. But I tell you, there was uh, around the time I was starting, there were two other uh, actors from Greek backgrounds: George Spartels in Melbourne mm-hmm. and Nico Lathoris here in Sydney. Mm-hmm. And we would go along to, and obviously we would get cast in the same kind of roles, yeah, and audition for the same kind of roles. And it it bamboozled me one day. I turned up, and they didn't know whether I was Lex or George or Nico, and it didn't matter. Mm. Because yeah. we were interchangeable, yeah, yeah. you know, and I, I thought, wow, there's something going on that's weird yeah. here, you know. And, and, and we're not talking about the fifties or sixties; we're talking the about 80s. the eighties, seventies, yeah. and eighties. Yeah. Um, so it was anyway. The, the, to their credit, Gary and Tony went with the non-accent mm-hmm. thing, and that turned out to be uh, a very wise decision yeah. on their part, because that's where you come in. That's where it reached kids who were born here yep. who otherwise hadn't seen themselves on TV. Yeah. And that yeah. was the big, big thing about it. And, and I didn't realise that yeah. as much as 
as as it ended up being, and that was a really big thing. It was that generation of kids, who, post-war kids, mm. born in Australia, yeah. migrant families, they're not no representation anywhere, yeah. and suddenly they see one on TV, and yeah. it's like wow, yeah. And that was the most gratifying thing about it. I, I mean, and not only that, the, the the fact is, I mean, there was there was some th- that show produced a few big catchphrases. Oh yeah, you know, leave the money in the fridge. I um, still get it. Yeah, I still get it. Yeah, forty years later, people are like, I'll leave the money on the, the fridge. Leave the money on the fridge. Oh, yeah, good yeah, on you. Yeah, and that was for the beer, right? Yeah, because yeah. yeah. Wow, well, champagne. You're not getting any of that either. I don't want any. I've got a beer. One of mine. Yeah, that'd be right. Leave the money on the fridge. <laughs> but obviously, the the big one, you know, that concerned, you know, what we we're talking about today was that that your the father-in-law character Ross Higgins, who played Ross Higgins, was, was played by Ross Higgins, would call you a bloody wog. Yeah. I know you're going to have a wonderful time, you and Craig. You're going to be looked after like a king, and you don't even have to cook it. Why not? Cause Bruno's cooking it. Come on, Craig. <laughs> Bon appétit. Bloody wog. <laughs> this was before um, Wog's Out of Work, yeah. stage shows and so on. So was this probably the first time that, you know, we heard that on, on TV? Well, it I was. I mean, you would know. Yes, it yeah. was. It yeah. was. And, and, and at the time, I, I was really ambivalent about it. You know, mm. I, I thought... Is this right? You know, should I be doing this? Am I supporting mm. this? And I thought, but hang on. On the other hand, he is being painted to be, you know, he is being used as a character who is sexist and misogynistic and racist and yeah. sectarian and all of that. Yeah. And we're taking the piss out of him yeah. as much as he's taking the piss out of me. Yeah. Um, and and it was, as I say, it was the response of kids coming up and saying, it's really good, it's really terrific. And that's what kept me... That's what justified it to me because yeah. otherwise I, I, I might have walked away. But yeah. I didn't because I felt that responsibility to do that. And, it, uh, you know, I let's not kid ourselves. I mean, I was doing it for the money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I had a young family at the time and it yeah. meant some security. Yeah. And that's kind of what it meant at the time. And it's only subsequently that you that I realise how kind of important it was at that period that, that – Kids did get that representation. Yeah, because the show ran for about, what, four, four, four years? years? For about four years, yeah. How many episodes? I think we, we – we, I'll have to talk to Laurel, my, mm. my screen wife, because yeah. she's good on this stuff. I think we did about 100 yeah. episodes, I yeah. think, yeah. over that four years. Was yeah. that a lot for then? Or yeah, was it, it was just, for a comedy show. Yeah, right. For a yeah. comedy show, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, dramas can go on for years and years and yeah. years, you know, yeah. but – it's hard to sustain a comedy for yeah. that long. Yeah. And I think we did it for pretty well for that amount of time. I yeah. mean, I, I don't know. I've never seen it, so it's hard to say. Yeah. But my recollection is that we may have been limping towards the finishing yeah. line. But, yeah. um, but I think most of those 100 episodes stand up as being funny. Yeah. So here you are in the 80s, in the early 80s, what started in 1980, 1984, right? Yeah. Um, you're thrust onto Australian TV. Of course, that's all we had. There was no internet and so on. We had no other, we had another pretty much means of entertainment apart from the radio and, and watching TV. Yeah. And, you know, in those days, it was just those, you know, few channels that we had. So, you know, you had to watch something if you wanted to be entertained. And so that would have thrust you into the into the limelight oh, in a big be, way. I, I had no idea, you know, I... I first became aware of it kind of at the supermarket when mm-hmm. people would push their trolleys into mine um, <laughs> just to stop and have a chat. And yeah. I thought, oh, well, there's something going on here. Yeah. Um, but then I really noticed that after it had, it had gripped and was really popular, um, I really noticed it going to the pub. Yeah. Oh, man. I just had to stop going to the pub for a while because <laughs> I remember one, you know, apart from... I mean, how do you sign an autograph on a soggy beer case? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like yeah, there's no it's really back then, hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Mate, have you got a have you got a non soggy beer case that I could sign? Um, but there was one guy I remember, and he was adamant that I'd had, had, had this raging affair with his sister. He was from some country town I'd never been to in my life, and he was adamant that I'd been there, that I'd you know I'd had dinner there. I'd 
disappeared somewhere with his sister and done something. Um, and he just, and I kept saying, and he was getting quite aggressive about it, as though I were. And then it got to that weird point where I was thinking, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what if he's right? <laughs> what if it actually happened? I'm going to get out of here. Um, but I mean, I found that uncomfortable. You know, I, 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 not so much that the. I understand the fact that if you're in people's lounge room, yeah. then you're kind of part of the family, even if yeah. it is only for half an hour Absolutely. a week. Mm. Um, but, you know, you, they feel they know you. Yeah. And I, I, I dig that I, and I get it. Um, but it's just there was a line that got crossed a little bit too often for my liking where they actually thought you were in their lounge room mm. physically, in reality. And I find that, and especially when it started to get a little bit aggressive, it's like, oh, what? We're not good enough for you. You know, you don't want to admit you came to our house. I started to think, oh, this is the road to madness. I mm. get it. And so I stopped going to the pub for, a while, yeah. for quite a while. And it actually put me off performing for a little while. Really? So, yeah. So I spent most of the next, most of the rest of the 80s, I spent directing because I didn't want to be in front of the camera. Yeah. But was there a backlash, I mean, from, from ethnic groups? Saying, oh, you know, you're you're perpetuating this, you know, wog uh, uh, well, word, was, and you know, yeah. we, we're getting abused, or people are calling us wogs, or or it's okay to call us a bloody wog because this, the, you know, the yeah. Ted Bullpit character was calling you. Because well, it was, a, it was a, from, I mean, I was a kid, right? Mm, I'm, mm. I'm born seventy four, so by the time that I remember seeing it, I was nine, ten years old. Okay, um, and uh, not even eight years old. I remember it was a big thing yeah. for me. Yeah, you know. So, so what did you notice around well, I you? I was torn about to that, I, and and I, I, I kind of kept one questioning that. You know, mm. is this the right thing to be doing? But, but as I say, I mean, the the support it got kind of outweighed the criticism, right? And I could understand the criticism because I felt some of those emotions myself. Yeah. You know, is this the right thing to be doing? Am I perpetuating? Am I giving him license to call me a wog? Yeah. You know, has he got agency to do this and all? Yeah. Oh, so I, I did have those kind of yeah. conflicting thoughts going on. But ultimately I thought, no, when I look at the show overall, what we're doing is we're taking the piss out of a certain kind of of a character that represent us, represents Australia at a transitional stage. Yeah. And I'd worked with not, I don't mean Ross Higgins, the guy who played it, but, mm. I'd, but I'd known men like Ted Bullpit. Yeah. And, and I was determined to do whatever I could to make their world as uncomfortable as possible for them. Yeah, right. And if that was through comedy mm-hmm. or through drama, yeah. then I was all for it. Yeah. And I, I thought, well, there may be, some, you know, there may be some scratches and bruises along the way, but yeah. ultimately, I think it's the right thing to be doing. Yeah. I think we've got to deconstruct that notion of that kind of Australian. Yeah. Not just in terms of ethnicity and racism, but the attitudes towards women, attitudes towards other religions. Mm-hmm. And that's because, you know, let's go back, a, let's go back half a century or, or a little bit more. You know, when Australia federated in 1901, the very first act in the Constitution was the immigrant immigration, the Immigrant Rest- Restriction Act, oh. the White Australia policy. Yeah. Yeah. So they, you know, there was a very, so when we federated, that parliament decided we don't want anyone who's not white in our country. Mm. And that took hold. And, you know, by the... By the 1920s, the late 1920s, it's a staggering, like 97%, 98% of Australia were Anglo. Yeah. You know, and it was it was publicised. It was used to, it was advertised as a, as white Australia for white people. You yeah. know, this is a country you can come to where you're not going to have to deal with anyone who's not white. Yeah. So that was very firmly rooted in the nat- national psyche. And I think anything that could dismantle that was good, yeah, and particularly with the post World War Two migration, yeah. it's like, you know, and I still get it. Uh, it's like, look around you, walk mm. down the street. Who do you see? Do you yeah. think we're all tourists? <laughs> <laughs> it's like yes. we live here. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. We work here. Yeah. You know, and we're not just picking fruit and in the cafes and stuff anymore. We've educated our kids. Yeah. We value education. Yeah. That's why we came here, because yeah. if we work hard, we can ad- we can get a better life for our children. Yeah. That's why we're doctors and lawyers and accountants and yeah. every aspect of life you want to look at, every strata of society, you'll find wog kids yeah. who've got there because their parents worked hard yeah. and gave them the opportunity. Yes. And anything that took down that notion of white Australia or that hierarchy of there being, you know, different races were, you know, on different yeah. rungs of the ladder. That had to be dismantled. Yeah. yeah. And how did the other actors feel about Oh, they were like, very supportive. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, I think you were saying... Um, Ross was great. Yeah, Ross, Ross was great. Yeah. He felt... He, he, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was an interesting character, Ross he Higgins, was wasn't he? man, and a very yeah. interesting character, very complex character. But he was more offended by him saying wog yeah. than I was. yeah. yeah. You know, every week, <laughs> God love him, every week he would come up and say, do you mind if I say this word? I said, Ross, it's the same word you said last week that you asked me about. It was okay last week, it's okay this week. The script says wog, you say yeah, the script. Yeah, That's yeah. what the character's based yeah, on. Yeah. He was great. He was a lovely man. So he, he genuinely, and the others were, uh, you know, they were really supportive. They yeah. they yeah. understood what was going on yeah. and they wanted to be part of it. Yeah. He was quite quirky, quirky kind oh, of way, yeah, wasn't he? he was eccentric. He, he, he had a remarkable career. He he was uh, he was one of those guys who was pitch perfect. Right. And he could, and not just human noises, he could re- reproduce any noise, any sound he heard. He, I can't, how, how long have we got? Anyway... I mean, one day he came in and he went, well, early do you do? I said, what's that, Ross? He said, that's hello, how are you, backwards. Yeah, and right. I said, why, why would you? <laughs> yeah. When do you think that's going to become useful? Yeah. Because yeah. he was an only kid, so he was, trans- he was fixed to the radio and he could produce every sound. And he decided one day with a reel-to-reel tape recorder mm-hmm. that he would record, hello, how are you? the right way around, then yeah. take the tapes off and switch them around and get it going backwards, and he'd learn it going backwards, and then he'd say it backwards into the tape machine, yeah. take the tapes off again, put them on to see if it came out as, hello, how are you? Yeah. That's like, Ross, that is a remarkable thing to do, but I just don't know why you've got that much time on Yeah, that's hands. right. Yeah, why would he need to do that? But, that's, I mean, that's, that was his brilliance because he, he, he did had oh, a big voiceover. Korean voiceovers, right? Oh, yeah. man, he was like, and all those character voices, mm-hmm. all of the cartoon characters, mm-hmm. he, he was like a one-man Warner Brothers studio. So what, what voices did he... Uh, he did the Louis the Fly. From right. The, he yep. did all of the Kellogg's, Coco Pops, you know, yep. Snap, Crackle and Pop, all those yeah, character right. voices. Mr. Sheen. Yeah. Because he was perfect pitch. He was a singer as well. Positive debacle. Now all you see is sparkle because we polished as we cleaned with Mr. Sheen. Louis the Fly, I'm Louis the Fly, straight from rubbish tip to you. Right. He started out, in fact, in vaudeville as the boy, yeah. Ross Higgins, the boy singer. Yeah. But... Somewhere along the line, and I, I think it's related to the fact that his voiceover work was so important, yeah. he got a phobia about germs because, obviously, for you and I, it's a cold. Yeah. For him, it's thousands of dollars of work that he can't do right. if he gets a cold. Yeah. So I think that's where it originated. So he, he was paranoid about <laughs> germs. He would bring his own knife. to the. So we when we rehearsed and had meal breaks and stuff like that, he kind of stayed clear of the catering because he just yeah. didn't know where it had been. Yeah. Uh, he bought his own thermos of boiled water yeah. rather than from the urn because he's like a <laughs> wog, he's like a wog father. Yeah. There's germs in the urn. <laughs> you know? uh, he had, had his own glad wrap knife and he'd yeah. bring out an apple out of glad yeah. wrap and he'd slice big bits off it. And throw them away, and then he'd take a little sliver near, before he got too close to the core. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? You've, you've eaten one tenth of the apple. Yeah. It's enough. It's enough. Wow. He was, and he, wow. he, I, I remember one day he said to me, there was a show we were talking about that was coming to town. And he said, yeah, hey, I must get in early. You must book early for that so I can get in the back row. I said, what? Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Don't you book early so you can get down the front and you get better seats? No. Nah. The back row on the aisle. That way he can sit on the aisle and he's got no one on that side of him. He's got his wife on this side of him. Because it's the back row, there's no one behind him wow. that can cough on him. Because yeah. the moment anyone coughs yeah. in the audience, he's out of there. Yeah. He's gone. Yeah. 
And in fact, you know, it's interesting that you say that because sometimes we have a look at when, when shows go on sale and we have a look at how much of the tickets have been sold and you can see the 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 map on online yeah, and, yeah. And, and you and you see, you know, sometimes the, the back row being born I go, who buys these tickets? <laughs> Ross. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Rust buys them all. Yeah. So Germaphobes absolutely. buy those tickets. Absolutely. You know, either that or people who just want to quickly get out once the show's done. It's no good. They want to be able to leave. Yeah, oh, that's true. Yes. <laughs> and if it's, yeah. yeah, and leave quickly. Yeah. But they basically, they sit in the back row so people can't cough on them. Yeah. And especially in these pandemic days, yeah. who's to say they're wrong? Yeah, well, true. <laughs> true. And so what happened? So the show went on for four years. Yeah. And then it wound up. Um, where did you go after that? Because you had a, a very interesting directing uh, career, oh, I didn't you? I moved mainly into directing after mm. that. I started directing in, <clears throat> in theatre because I, I was a kind of I was the, of that generation that had grown up mainly with theatre pretending to be English, yeah, because that was our theatre culture. And then there was big changes in the late sixties, early seventies. There was a big push towards a national identity, and uh, a lot of Australian plays were being. Written, so I, I grew up with those, and the, the timing was good for me. Um, and I was always one of those actors, especially working on new scripts, said, Oh, look, why don't we do this? Or, you know, why don't we move that bit from there and get, and cut that bit and put that there? So I was always, I always had an opinion, you know. Yeah. yeah. Did, did that, did that, um, uh, did you contribute a lot to the, um, to the script of, of, um, Kingswood Country because oh. of the, the Greek. You know, your great heritage, did you say, you know, the, the guy would not do this, yeah, he would do it like this? Yeah, indirectly. But, uh, right. They they weren't big on making a lot of changes. But right. It, but if you could, if you were smart enough to drop something in that seemed like an ad lib mm-hmm. and it worked, then it was like the Wagga Wagga stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of got its place there. But you couldn't actually go up and say, yeah. look, I've rewritten this to do this because yeah. this is funnier. Yeah. It, that, you know, that wasn't our job. Yeah. Um, but in theatre, there was more leeway, yeah. especially working on new plays. And, and so there was a new play that came along and uh, and they were looking for a director for it and someone said, why don't you direct it? Mm-hmm. You're always got an opinion. You're mm-hmm. always telling us how you could do it better. Yeah. Why don't you do it? And so I did it and I enjoyed it. And, yeah. and I'd always, even when I started out, I was more... Fast. You don't have a lot of control as an actor, mm, mm. Um, and as a director, you have more control. And you, you know, and and also the thing I liked about directing, one of the things I liked about it was once the show was on, you didn't have to be there six nights a week. Yeah, right. You know, you could drop yeah. in. You didn't have to shave every day. Yeah. You know, I yeah. Thought, yeah. this is good. <laughs> now, one thing that was very interesting about the show and, and a lot of the shows back then was that we filmed in front of a live studio audience. Yeah. Tell us about that because we don't really see that these days, do we? Well, Kingswood Country, there is no canned laughter. Right. It, it is all live audience. Yeah. So we would get the scripts Tuesday night. Yes. We would rehearse Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning. We'd run through it two or three times each morning mm-hmm. just to make, you know, learn it and yeah. make get all the moves. And then we would go to the studio on Saturday morning. We'd do a rehearsal with the camera crew. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all the camera angles were right. Then we'd have a break for lunch. Ross would have his knife and his apple and his boiled <laughs> water. Uh, we would eat normally. Yeah. Um, and then the audience came in, and that audience would be shown the previous week's episode that mm-hmm. we'd recorded, yes. and, uh, edited up, so their laughter track would get added to the laughter track that was already from the previous audience, right. and they'd do that, and then we would do the new show, this week's show, and they would respond to that. And then we would have another meal break, and a second audience would come in, so we would do each show twice. Right. To two different audiences, and they would amalgamate the laugh tracks yeah. from both audiences, and that's how we did. And it was great because we'd all come from, you know, I mean, Ross was, Ross was an old vaudevillian, mm-hmm. so he knew how to work an audience. Yeah. Judy Farr, who played Thelma, who was mm-hmm. really the, um, she was the linchpin of the whole thing. She yeah. kept us all sane yeah, because um, she made that quirky character work in such mm-hmm. a way that she was wonderful. She'd come from a re- review background. Yeah. Um, there was a brother, Ted Bullpitt's brother, I forget what his name is, the actor was Colin McEwen, late Colin McEwen, and his wife, he was a Datsun dealer. Right. <laughs> it's all coming back to me. Yeah. And his wife, Mel, you know, they were all live review performers, yeah. so they knew how to work an audience. Yeah. And, and, uh, 
And uh, and especially, you know, comedy with no one there yeah. is, like, really difficult. Well, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole point of, of having a live audience, uh-huh. you know, is that, you know, every 20 seconds you know how you're going in this yeah, business. Yeah, yeah, so, Oh, yeah, the yeah. reviews are instant. Yeah. So essentially, basically, what you were doing with every week's episode, you were – it was a new play. Doing a new play, yeah. It was a new play every yeah. week. And so yeah. that's the way, you know, I mean, it's fascinating for, for, for the people who are listening who who just don't understand that yeah, kind yeah, of a concept. Yeah. Or, you know, young kids today are thinking, you know, a film, you know, a, a sitcom gets filmed, edited, they put in laughter at the right times, you know, and you can easily do that today, especially because of the, you know, computers and so on. But... This was not like that, you know. And no, had, but had you know you, yourself, you, yeah. and, you know, you, the show, you, the, your show yesterday was fabulous. It was Thank fantastic. You. And just to see, I mean, just the growth in you as an artist, but the, what your ability to respond to the audience, because the audience tells you where they want to go. That's right. Don't they? I mean, it, yeah. and you just pick up on stuff and you think, oh, hang on, this yeah. is a bit that, didn't go so well last night, but exactly. this person's got it and they've infected the person beside them and yeah. the person behind them. Yeah. And we can riff on that for a little bit. Yeah. You know, I can exactly pull right. up some other stuff that's going to respond to that. Yeah. And it, that's the na- and that's the nature of a sitcom as well. Yeah. Especially with those kind of performers who yeah. are used to an audience. Yeah. You know, there'd be some stuff that we, we, we would find funny at rehearsal. Yeah. We'd get in front of an audience that's like, what a, this is not funny. Yeah. And there'd be right. other stuff that we would think, Oh, that's that's terrible! Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. What yeah. are we going to do with this? And the audience would be, <laughs> yeah. I said, well, we're onto yeah. something here. Yeah. You know, so that's that relationship. You can't break it. So, can I ask you this then? Because obviously, you know, when you got the camera, it's the fourth fourth wall, or the fourth, yeah. you know, they say, um, and in a live scenario, you know, in a live play, if something happens, it's an ad lib, and it makes you laugh. You know, when people are in a theatre and see that. That's kind of fine. You can sort of crack up. Yeah. You compose yourself, and away you go with the rest of the, the script. How do you, how do you deal with that when when you're filming for a sitcom? Because <laughs> surely well, there were t- and over a hundred episodes, yeah. there would have been several times where, where oh, you would have cracked up. The absolutely did we ever? There got to did be. Did that pro- make? I can't remember. Did that make it to 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 the, the final? Blooper, the blooper reel is huge. Yeah, <laughs> the right. Blooper yeah. reel is longer than the show. Yeah, right. Um, and there got to be a point where Ross and I couldn't look at one another yeah, without right. laughing. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. we, I would have to look away. And I can see it. When I see clips of it, the, yeah. the, occasionally they throw up on comedy shows yeah. and stuff like that. And I, it brings it back so vividly. Yeah. And I can just see Ross and I not looking at one another because yeah. the moment we did, yeah, yeah. we would collapse in laughter. <laughs> Thank um, you. But that was the advantage of having two audiences. Yeah. So if something went wrong at the first show... We could pick it up in the second show and make yeah. sure it went better. Yeah, and so they, the produ- the directors had had the producers had two shows to intercut. Yeah, right. Um, and I think there's one show notoriously where there's they use Ross coming through a door and he's got a serviette tucked in his collar of his shirt. And I think they used it from the first show where he's got the serviette tucked yeah. in the collar. Of and as he comes through the swinging door, they've used the cut from the second show and. It's magically disappeared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember too from that show that he would, when he when he was uh, flabbergasted about something, he he would spit out his drink. Or there was times when he would he'd be drinking either his tea or a beer or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you know he would hear something or you would say something to yeah. him that he was so shocked about that he would just spit it. Yeah. Am I right? When That's did you, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, that happened. Yeah. It was, um, there, was lot, there was stuff they got us to do. <laughs> I'm amazed we did some of the stuff they asked us yeah. to do. And especially Ross, you know, they had, uh, they had we went camping <laughs> as though we would have gone camping. Yeah. There was something that, and Ross and I ended up stranded the two of us camping at night time yeah. for some reason that escapes me. And they piled shit on him. Like yeah. They had trees coming down, stuff yeah. like that, and there's leaves going everywhere and all that and dirt, and he's and he's just coated in it stuff, and he's still spitting out his drink <laughs> and stuff like that. It was uh, it was exceptional, the, the things that he uh, tolerated that yeah. they got him to do. Yeah. It was good. Do you think that the show itself, um, even though when it, when it finished, it sort of opened up... Um, 
the doors to for other producers to kind of bring in those kind of shows. What, what, what's your thought on that? From um, being in those, I was I was too young to remember what kind of came after that. What, uh, yeah, what, what are your I, thoughts I, on I'm, that? I mean, it certainly it certainly did. I, I believe it paved the way for things like uh, Wogs Out of Work for Nick and Simon, yeah. and yeah, you know, I think it it enabled that. I think the best thing it did was it 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 showed the networks that there was a more diverse audience than they previously were yeah. prepared yeah. to admit. Yeah. And I think that was the big thing about it. Yeah. So that suddenly you got more diverse characters in yeah. in dramas. Yeah. You know, prior to that you had, you know, all those Crawford cop shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there was no real mm-hmm. diversity. I think John Orchick may have been in one of those cop shows, mm-hmm. and he was about the only cop that was not Anglo, and yeah. you know, and the crooks were not ang- were all yeah. Anglo, and yeah. you know, and the goodies were all Anglo, and yeah. I, it it did kind of open up a little bit the idea that there is a bigger audience out there than yeah. we're thinking of. Yeah. So I think it had that effect, and you know, and things are, my, you know, I, uh, they've improved in some areas. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of more diverse casting that mm-hmm. goes on now, but still. Still, the stats say that if you're an actor from a non-Anglo background, yeah. you are less likely to be employed. Yeah. So that's still that's still constant. Um, uh, sadly, uh, but but it, it has changed a bit. But yeah. I think you know it, it fascinates me because you see the reality TV shows and they're much more representative of our population. Yeah. You know, you see a cooking show, yeah. and it's like, where's the Anglo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can't we get a token Anglo yeah, in here? Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> <laughs> because, oh, we've yeah. got Wong's cooking, yeah, you know, why, yeah, yeah. what's going on? Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think we've still got to address that yeah. balance a bit. But yeah. um, but uh, I think the, the importance at the time was it did it, there was a sense that there was yeah. – not just diversity in the characters, but the real sense that the audience was a bit wider yeah. and a bit smarter yeah. than we'd otherwise taken them for. Yeah, yeah. Now, you were involved in the Bodyline series. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, it was uh, that was an opportunity that came up while I was doing Kingswood Country. Yeah. Um, and, and sorry, and I, 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 can I stop you there? For, for those people who are... You know, because this podcast goes right, yeah. all over the world. Do you, can you just give us a brief background of what Bodyline was? Okay, Bodyline yeah. was uh, an, uh, a tactic that was used. So the traditional rivalry in cricket, national rivalry is between England and Australia, yeah. the Colonials versus the mother country. And the Australia had, in the late 20s and 30s, had a supremely gifted batsman called Donald Bradman, yeah. who was almost unstoppable. So it, it was impossible to get him out on some days. He was he was elite in the way that nobody has come yeah. even close to him. Have average of 99. 99.94 is test average, yeah. yeah. Um, and England had a very, very cunning captain called Douglas Jardine, who devised this tactic of bowling the ball short so that it bounced towards the batsman's head and body, mm-hmm. hence it was a body line, and, and had the field placed in such a way that if the batsman tried to play a shot, yeah. then he would inevitably hit a catch. Yeah. Because it was, it was, so it was a, an attack on the body, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that, so that was a metaphor for the relationship between England and one of its colonies and the colony taking its own independence, Mm -hmm. moving away Mm. from the mother country because the mother country was seen to be unsporting and and bordering on unlawful within the rules of the game. Yeah. And so the opportunity came to, um, to, and it was Kennedy Miller uh, that was the production house and uh, I knew Miller, George Miller, Dr. George, he was Mm -hmm. a... Good Greek boy, George mm. Miliotis. Right. Good Greek yeah. boy who became yeah. a doctor, but yeah. had this incredible gift for film and yeah. for storytelling. And, and of course, the, anglicised his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the Greeks yeah. are pretty good at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, oh, my dad used to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if any Australian achieved anything, he'd say, he's Greek, you know. Yeah, I say, yeah. Dad, I don't think so. Shane Warne is <laughs> Greek, you know. I said, Shane Warne's not Greek. <laughs> yeah. I know his cousin, he's Greek. <laughs> 
<laughs> but there you go. He watches yeah. in cream on his nose. <laughs> Who does that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Greeks don't yeah. do that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, so the opportunity came to to be one of the writers and directors on Bodyline. Yeah. And uh, and it was a time when Kingswood Country was at its height, but mm-hmm. sort of getting towards its end. And I, I'd, as I'd said previously, I, I was looking not to perform for a while. Mm. I wanted to get on yeah. the other side of the camera. And so that opportunity came up and it, this series was very successful. And it was funny because it was uh, the directors, the other directors were Carl Schultz, who had no experience of cricket whatsoever. He'd right. come from um, Hungary, uh, from Hungary, I think. Yeah. And um, George Ogilvy, who had no experience of cricket. I was the only one who played any cricket yeah. of the writers and directors on it. Um, so I, I kind of it was technical advisor as well early on um and it was a, it, the series was successful and you know and once you direct one thing then um you get offers to direct other things yeah. and a couple of movies came along and stuff yeah. like that and so i spent that most of that next decade and a half directing i'm so i still did some occasional performing but yeah. um but i was happier yeah. directing and by the stage you know as i say my, my family was growing and i kind of wanted to spend more time at home rather than be on stage six nights a week. So yeah. it suited me. Yeah. And another thing that a lot of people don't know about is, well, you know, it's obviously your fans do, but the wider audience don't know is that you were involved with a lot of comedy, those comedy debates in the time. Yeah, yeah. they were big. Yeah. yeah. So when tell us that? about that. With the, that was with Andrew Denton. Andrew um, Denton, a wonderful man. Wendy Harmer. Wendy, yeah. Gene yeah. Kitson, uh, a wonderful guy called Campbell McComas who was a – a lawyer who was um, – he was one of those guys who, in the corporate circuit, he could create characters that that would start out saying, you know, give a keynote speech. He'd be, yeah. So he'd invent a character. Yeah. And he'd, he'd re- research it and all that. Be yeah. a very super, super big mm. brain, you know. Yeah. And he, he, he was one of those acts that would, um, that would start out and he'd sound very reasonable. Yeah. And just incrementally, yeah. he'd start to say things that was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Until mm. by the end of it, he was this raving lunatic. Yeah. And the audience was thinking, I don't know whether we're meant to take this seriously <laughs> or not. Yeah. He used to adjudicate. Yeah. He used to be the mediator in the debates. Yeah. And so, you know, is sex important or is science important or whatever? And, you know, is football stupid? Whatever the mm. dumb topics they'd come yeah. up with. And we'd have to take a point of view on, you know, either for or against yeah. the debate. And they became very popular. And so there must have been half a dozen or so that we did for ABC TV. Yeah. But dozens more that were we did on the corporate circuit. You know, so if, it were, if we're talking to, you know, if it was a real estate convention or whatever, the yeah. debate would be about, you know, is real estate yeah. important? Can you trust a real yeah. estate agent? Or whatever it was, you yeah. know. Um, is real estate sexy? Sex always seemed to be, you know, yeah. seemed to be the common denominator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. what, what can you do? Um, and so, they, yeah, they were quite um, quite popular. They were a lot of work, you know. It's, um, were you writing as yeah, well as, yeah, yeah right. So you had seven minutes. Yeah. You know, so, to, you know, a tight seven minutes is, yeah. um, is not always that easy. To, no. I don't find anyway. Yeah. I mean, you'd. Breeze it in, but yeah. but you know, yeah. uh, for me it was trying to get seven minutes of good material. Yeah, it would, and I found it stressful too. You know, because mm. you only get the one go at it. Yeah, um, and so you, you know, it's not like you have that opportunity to work the material yeah. and yeah. you know yeah. trim it and fi- yeah, finesse it and yeah. stuff like that. You yeah. get one go at it. Yeah, so it's like I used to try and have the core material there and learn pretty well, and I'd try and have a foundation of things that I'd try and anticipate what could go wrong and what could fall flat and whether I could very quickly modular slide something, slide a new module in. (laughs) But it's hard with untested material. You know, I found that really difficult. Was it – they weren't live, were they? Yeah, live audience. Oh, they were? Yeah. Um, Oh, they edited. No, they pre-recorded. But but it was a quick turnaround. Was this for the ABC? Yeah. 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 And, and uh, you know, I saw, I remember seeing some people who didn't prepare mm-hmm. 
you know, the personalities, you know, who were known in other fields and mm-hmm. then, and thought they'd just wing it. And, mm-hmm. oh, man, it was it was embarrassing. Yeah, right. You know what it's like, you know, they, they just, they thought this would be easy. I'll just, you know, yeah. I'll just talk a couple of things. And, yeah. and the audience is demanding. They yeah. want... They want you to well, work. It's, it's a comedy debate. It wasn't a serious debate. Absolutely. Right? It's about yeah. the jokes. It's yeah. not, you know, the subject matter is merely there as a springboard yeah. for the jokes yeah. and the persona you can create yeah. in that thing. And so if that, you know, if you're just going to wing it, it's like, oh, Jesus, yeah. good luck. But yeah. I'd be, you know, I'd be shitting razor blades if yeah. I were you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I like to have material well prepared. And, yeah. and the, you know, after two or three of them, I kind of had a, a an idea of what sort of persona I could use and what kind of territory I could work, whatever the subject was. Yeah, I could work into it. Um, but uh, they were they were good. They were great, yeah. and they were great fun. And there's some very funny people. We, you know, yeah. you see them all the time. But you yeah. know, we've got some very funny people in Australia. Yeah. yeah. You well, who, who who are the, some of the greatest people that you work with in Australian television oh, and, and Andrew, theatre? Uh, Andrew uh, Denton is. Uh, Probably, probably the best at that kind of stuff. Yeah. He's the the quickest. He's, yeah. The brain works like a hundred miles an hour, and yeah. he's he's very clever. Uh, Wendy Harmer is great. Jim yeah. Kitson is great. Um, Greg Pickover and John Doyle. Yeah. You know, H. G. Yeah. Nelson and Roy Slaver. Yeah. And when when they riff, they can really do some great stuff. Um, uh, oh. Will Anderson is, mm-hmm. is fantastic. Yeah, well, I love Will Live. He's Will, fantastic. Live, you know, he's he? a very clever man. Mm. Um, uh, oh, Anthony, what was Anthony's name? Anthony, uh, he was a funny man. Greg Fleet. Yeah. You know, yep. Fleet, yeah, he was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He could be, you know, he could be good or bad. Yeah. But uh, it was a, it was spectacularly good or spectacularly bad, <laughs> <laughs> just depending. Yeah, yeah. But he was a funny man. Oh, I, I mean, I, and my admiration for those guys yeah. uh, for what they do is it's like it's the heart. You know, in a play, you've got other people and yeah. you've got a character yeah. and you've got all of that. Yeah. But comedy, you're out there, you're naked. Yeah. It's just you. There's yeah. nowhere to hide. It's you're, you're naked. Totally. Really, you no, know. Totally. I mean, it's sometimes just like, mm, that's, yeah, this is it. This you is know? it. There's no one else coming on. No, you know, there's no one yeah, else. Yeah, you can't hide behind the, the drummer or the bass player no, or the backing it. vocalist that's or it. a wig or a, an outfit you know, or a character, even. You know, uh, no, it's never. It's, you know? And you can't. There's no one else to blame. There's no one else if to blame. If it dies, either. it dies. You yeah, know, yeah. And it's like, whoa, that's not so good. Yeah, I find that. Um, that's very interesting. This particular point, because today comedy has changed so much in in the way that you become famous as a comedian these days. I mean, there's a lot of internet. Yeah, acts, yeah. it's all social um, media. And social media, there's a lot of editing. Um, and when you, you know, how, how do you put that onto a stage show yeah. for a very long time and make it work? Um, and I think that, uh, in, you know, like a pilot, you know, you, when, when you say to a pilot, how long have you been doing this? They don't say, oh, I've been doing it for 20 years. I've, I've you know, flown 15,000 hours. Yeah. And I think that's that's really, you know, the, the art of the, good the, analogy, the, yeah. of the comedian. Is, yeah. you, know, the, you know, okay, you might have done it on, online and you've done a few stages. How, how many hours, how many thousands of hours have you spent on stage honing your craft? And that is what you go to see when you go and see a great comedian. I think. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and and I mean, I, you know, no, uh, uh, social media is such a good idea. It is. It's just in practice, it's not so wonderful. No. you know, it's no. gotten out of hand and yeah. it's unregulated and all that yeah. stuff. And I, and you're right. I mean, I've seen, I've seen funny acts on social media who yeah. then, you know, get up live and it's like, whoa. Mm. you're really exposed, yeah. you know, and yeah. you need to do some work because your yeah. material is not that good yeah. and you're not handling it all that well. That's right. And mm. the other thing is you have established no relationship with me mm. as an audience whatsoever. Mm. And yeah. that's the that's the big thing. That's the biggest difference I noticed yeah. in yeah. terms of it's a very basic thing that we do, yeah. Joe. You yeah. know, and it's happened for... 
thousands and thousands and thousands of years. You know, it's, we're sitting around the campfire at yeah. night. There's nothing to do yeah. except look at the campfire and look at the stars. Mm. And some joker gets up and says, this is what happened on the hunt today yeah. when we were hunting the wild boar. Yeah. And imitates the wild boar and we think that's funny. Yeah. That's been thousands and yeah. thousands of years. Yeah. And you can't get around the fact that the the basis of it is it's a communal experience. Mm -hmm. It's you talking to your community, yeah. telling stories. They're either sad stories, they're happy stories, they're triumphant stories, they're funny stories. They're about how good was the harvest today, yeah. how big was the river today, what about that other tribe that we were fighting, did you see that guy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's about talking to your community. Yeah. And once you break that, mm -hmm. then there's nothing there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't think you can do it just talking to a camera. No, no, you can't. I mean, look, there, there, there's, I mean, that, that's a medium that, you know, if you're good at oh, it, yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah, sure. But, you know, bringing it to the live stage, I think, is, is you know, you really got to be very good at, you know, not being able to do that. You got to you talk know? to you, to yeah. the community that are there. You got yeah. to, and you got to turn them into it. The thing that fascinates me most about theatre is you get all of these random people, 350, yeah. 500, yeah. 1,200 people yeah. who don't know one another, yeah. just a random group yeah. of people all yeah. together, and you've got to turn them into one. Yeah. You've got to yeah. turn them into an audience. Yeah. Well, essentially, and I love that challenge. Essentially what you're doing is you're asking um, a room full of strangers who are strangers to themselves and to you totally. to have a simultaneous <laughs> involuntary reaction. What? I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's insane. Why would you do that? <laughs> yeah. Why would you think you could do yeah, that? No, for two hours. <laughs> for two hours, you're mad. You know, it's like, why would they do it? And that's yeah. wonderful. And and the thing I love about it is that you also know early on, you know, yeah. they give you, you know, they're yeah. not stupid. Yeah. yeah. They'll give you five minutes. Yeah. And if you haven't hooked them by that, yeah. they're looking at their yeah. watch. They're thinking, Where, where's the yeah. waiter? Yeah. Yeah. Where's the bar staff? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get a yeah. meal. I'm going to, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's it's amazing. I, yeah. I just love that yeah. that chemistry. Well, you know, um, we should tell the viewers. So last night I did a show. Mm. I mean, I'm not sure when this episode will come out, but, you know, last night I did a show and you were there. You came mm. to the show. Um, and as, if you, as you recall, you know, I give away prizes. And I gave away a prize to this kid. So there was 500 something people. You know, it was a great show. A lot of people were laughing. But all I could think of was this one kid on the left of me who just was bored. He uh -huh. just wasn't uh -huh. laughing. Okay, and I'm yeah. thinking, why are you here? I mean, I think that maybe he got, a, you know, he got dragged along, you know. And the worst thing was, I don't know if you could see it from where you were, he wasn't laughing, but he looked kind of ethnic yeah, that he should have yeah, got yeah. it but his girlfriend was 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 white Cacum. she was yeah, she was she wasn't even she was just like i don't even know why i'm here why am i doing here you know <laughs> what, who dragged me along to this and so you know here i am everyone else is pissing themselves laughing all i can see is this guy down here yeah. and, and it's really oh, annoying no, me you can pick the, <laughs> yeah, isn't it amazing how 500 yeah. people yeah. You, you just the antenna yeah. goes up yeah. you can pick the one who's not laughing yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even if they're sitting up the back in the dark, yeah. it's like, what's yeah. wrong? Yeah, what's wrong, yeah. You know, you but know. it's that weird thing is, how come everyone else is getting it? Yes. And you're not. And you're not, yeah. It's, it's a weird it. thing. It, it was funny when we were going home, <laughs> I to think, and you were talking about the Wog families and mm. stuff, and I, and, and I had this argument with my wife because it was, um, it was council clean-up. Right. And we have total different views, like yeah. diametrically yeah, opposing right. views on what that means. She sees it. Yes. Which I don't get. She sees it as an opportunity to get rid of stuff. Right. And I see it as an opportunity to <laughs> look what's in the street, yeah. the fruits of the street. <laughs> and, and it's like the right price. Yeah. <laughs> That's the right. It's you nothing. Know. Cost nothing. Yeah. Look at this. Look at this bowl. Yeah. We could use this yeah. bowl. Yeah. What did you say? We've got bowls. Yeah, uh, yeah but this one is good. Yeah. And, and it's like <laughs> the bowls we've already got. So if we break one, yeah. we've got a spare. Yeah, it's funny. In, in, um, <laughs> in neighbourhoods where there's lots of ethnics, and they have, I think it's, I think they call it hard rubbish, hard rubbish week. The the rubbish never leaves the street. No, no, it just gets recycled. <laughs> recycled. And, and they're a brawl. 
pulls over. <laughs> Who's going to get to watch me throw it out? Well, see, my wife doesn't get that. Yeah. She just thinks it's rubbish. Let it go. Yeah, let it go. I said, no, you can't. Look yeah. at that wood. I could yeah, use yeah, that wood yeah. next year for Isn't kindling. Isn't that amazing? I know. Isn't that amazing? I know. You know. Lex, what, 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 what do you do these days? What, what, you know, what occupies your time? Oh, I still, um, there's still a job on the horizon. Yeah. So I still do a bit of filming, a bit of telly from time to time. Yeah. A little bit of radio. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm, it's hard to see me doing uh, much theatre work, much as mm. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I'm at the point where I'm starting to, where six nights a week is, is difficult. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily want to be working six nights a yeah. week. Uh, it's certainly not for a run of, you know, six yeah. weeks or eight yeah. weeks or something like that. So those days I think are over. Mm-hmm. And also I worry these days that I can learn it and remember mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. you know, and am I going to make a fool of myself mm-hmm. or, you know, a, yeah. a bigger fool of myself. Yeah. Um, so, but but enough, uh, enough telly and enough film and enough yeah. radiator. Keep me interested and yeah. a little bit of teaching, yeah. which I enjoy t- yeah. working with younger people. Yeah, um, but mainly, I mean, my gigs these days are mainly babysitting. Yeah, uh, we got You're a we've, got, we've yeah. got seven and a half grandchildren. Yeah. you know, and it's they're great. a handful. Yeah, and they're you know they they always need help. Yeah, their parents need help, yeah. and uh, and we love them, and we're happy to help. Yeah, you know, we're happy to give them back. But, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're all good, and it's it's great to see, you know yeah. we love them dearly and yeah. see them all emerge with their own different personalities yeah. and you yeah. know it's uh, it's fascinating. Yeah, now, you've had a great and celebrated career. Um, my last question to you is, um, what did you do to live your best life? Uh, there's no getting around the fact I've been incredibly lucky. I, mm-hmm. I'm very aware of that, and I I, I feel. Uh, that's just the way, you know, Dad was a gambler and, yeah. you know, I, I was dealt a good hand mm-hmm. and uh, and I hope I've played it well. Yeah. Um, I've had opportunities and I've had a, been fortunate enough to have a loving family and yeah. be supported that way. And uh, I did work hard um, and I wanted to work hard and I think that helped with the luck. But... Um, I just try and be better at stuff, you know. I'm, uh, and I often I heard it before, and I didn't realise what it meant until I was in that position. But I'm a better grandfather than I was a father, yeah. um, and I, I'd love to be able to go back. And but the grandkids are an opportunity to do things that I got wrong as a father, which yeah. mainly was, you know, not enough time and not yeah. enough tolerance and yeah. stuff like that. So, so, uh, and I, I hope. I just hope that, that I haven't made the world any worse <laughs> than it was before I was born. You know, uh, as long as I haven't contributed to it being a, a shittier place than yeah. it normally is, uh, I'm be kind of content with that. Lex Marinos, I don't think you have, man. I think you've made it a greater place to live. Mm. Thank you very much for being a guest. I really appreciate it. It's been an honour, mate. So likewise for me, and it's a pleasure and uh I've loved watching your career from the time we first met, whenever it was, 25 yeah. something years ago when when you were starting out. And there, I could see then that there was a spark there that I thought, if Joe gets the luck that he deserves, yeah. he's going to have a career. And you have. Thank so you, well mate. done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marvin. Thanks, Lex. That was great. Cool. Nice chat. Thank you very much. Okay.